Hi, this is Steffi, founder of She Can and the She Can channel. We're interviewing women from all walks of life. And today we have someone really exciting, Sarah Wilson. Sarah, tell us a bit more about yourself and what you do. Oh gosh, where do I start? I'm so old that my bio goes on forever and ever, but I was a journalist in Australia for many years. I was the editor of Cosmopolitan Australia. I was the host of MasterChef Australia. So I did all these kind of, I suppose, you know, in the public eye type jobs and uh, developed an illness when I was in my mid thirties called Hashimoto's disease. And my life took a completely different direction. And I produced a bunch of books. I quit sugar, moved into books about anxiety, about the climate crisis. I now have a podcast. I'm an activist. I've done a bunch of different things. I think that sums it up. Sarah, you really are an award-winning author, right? You, you, you have an unbelievably large amount of subscribers on Substack. People are eating up the things you write and you talk about. So Tell us a little bit more what your main motivator is in the things that you tackle in those different outlets. Yeah, well, before I write a book, I don't write a book because I just want to have my name on the cover of something and I want to chop down a bunch of trees. Um, I generally have this sort of what I call an itchy feeling. I can feel where everybody's at and I... I kind of get obsessed by it. I go down a rabbit hole and I research it and I ask people questions and I feel the pain that people might be feeling. And I figure that if a bunch of people I know are feeling it, a lot of other people will be feeling it. And then I I set out to write a book, which I hope mostly helps people to feel less alone in their, in their problems. Um, I think problems are great things. So I'm not about trying to eliminate people's problems with these great hacks and, you know, shortcuts. It's really about holding people's hands through complex issues. And I've been motivated in this way, I would say, since I was a very little girl. You know, my mother um, tells me that I told her when I was seven, I was going to be the first female prime minister of Australia or a nun. And um, mum couldn't quite work out how the two were connected. And I said, oh, it's because I can go off and do whatever I want. I can do things that are going to make a difference, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think I've just had that drive, uh, that drive in me from a very young age. Sarah, so this book, um, This One Wild and Precious Life, which I'm reading right now and before you wrote, uh, first we make the beast beautiful and of course you've done the sugar book and all the cookbooks and all of that. What do you think is the quality you have that make you so good at putting very complex issues into really almost simple words for every one of us to understand and to integrate and to feel so heard and so seen because really when i read this book um this one wild and precious life i feel as if you're writing from my soul yeah well i think a bit of a background i mean a background in journalism has probably helped i remember i used to get some mentorings from some great you know writers And they used to say to me, you know, if you're a really good journalist, if your reader says, I could have written that, that's exactly what I'm thinking, you know. So you write the things that they think that they're thinking about, you know, and you put it on page and and there's this recognition that goes on. And to do that, I suppose I've always, you know, I mean, I know a lot of people say this, but I grew up in, I grew up without friends. I grew up as an outsider. I grew up in the country on a subsistence living property. Um, I didn't really understand the world. So I think I spent a hell of a lot of time watching other humans and watching their emotional reactions to things. I'll also throw in there, and it's no big secret because I write about it in um, First We Make the Beast Beautiful, I have bipolar disorder and I was diagnosed when I was 21. It's not been an easy journey. Um, however, it's placed me in a position now where I really do use my anxiety as a superpower. It sounds like a cliche, but I mean, you know, that book took six, seven years to write, right? So I, I did the wrestle. I did the big wrestle with myself to kind of arrive at a point where my anxiety serves me. And the way that it serves me now, I think, is that I can go and burrow deep into complex, difficult, awkward issues and, and emerge again. I can stay longer, I think. I think that's what bipolar can afford you. Um, so that would probably be it having no friends and having bipolar. There we go. There's a perfect prescription for writing books. <laughs> 
And it's such a powerful story, Sarah. So tell us a little bit how you did that. How did you turn that beast into something so beautiful? How did you get to the space where you dug your heels so deep into the earth that you came out using it as a superpower now and having that incredible uh, capacity to do that because many people and many women that listen to our stories will resonate with that and are grappling with the same issue or other issues. How did you do that? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think sometimes it gets so bad, you know, that you have no other option than to solve it yourself. Um, so I think there was a bit of that. I mean, I, I, I do write about moments um, where I become very I come very close to taking my own life and there's been these moments where I've made a choice you know to live and that informs that next book right this one wild and precious life if you're going to live are you going to live a full life like you really mean it and you know the two stories are interwoven I suppose to that to that extent um but yeah I think uh, I have never wanted to settle for the easy answer, for the answer that's just uh, we'll give you a drug and go away and just, you know, keep quiet. Um, I've never settled for that. Anyone who has a major anxiety or depressive disorder will know what I mean. The drug never feels like the solution. It never feels like the, you know, it, it because what it's doing is it is actually trying to medicate something that feels very true to us. So that's what that book's about. That book really goes into the history, the bio, the evolutionary biology, but also the philosophy and everything of anxiety and the role that it's always played in, in culture and, and, and our history as humans. And it's a very important role. And we've forgotten about it. We've cut, we've masked it. And something that I think helps people to understand what I'm saying is that um, anxiety only entered the main therapeutic um, sort of diagnostic books, you know, the tools. So the DSM, which is used in the US, Australia, the UK, it only entered these diagnostic tools in 1980, about six months after the first anti-anxiety drug was invented, right? So, you know, what happened before then? Well, we had anxiety, but it was almost accepted as part of our existence. And of course, bipolar and, and extreme disorders have existed for a very long time. But there was a, a lot more acceptance around the role that it played, the positive role that it played. And so, yeah, I, my journey was really to unearth that understanding once again, to reframe it differently. And then, you know, the more recent book, what, what took me off around the world with a day pack, like a carry-on backpack, you know, it was 15 kilos or 35 pounds for three years, hiking around the world in the footsteps of all these philosophers and everything. It was a real desire to not accept that the despair that we were feeling about the climate crisis was something that we had to sink into, you know, nor that the solution had to be about somebody out there um, fixing it, nor was it about us being blamed, you know. So I felt that there needed to be a through line that, that we could relate to and that felt emotional, intuitive, and got, went back to the basics of our existence, hence the title, This One Wild and Precious Life, which, of course, is from a Mary Oliver poem, and her estate gave me permission to use it as the title of the book. But her poem goes, what are you going to do with this one wild and precious life, your, your one wild and precious life? And that's the ultimate question, isn't it, right? We can talk about we're destroying the habitat, we're doing all of this, um, and we've got to do something. Well, what do you want to do with your life? Do you want to connect to it and be part of it? Do you want to be a blossoming aspect of the, this matrix? Or do you want to go small and um, avoid it all? And you talk about that a lot in this book, which I absolutely love. And I love what you use that you say, I want to live a full fat Diet, diet life, right? I don't want to have that sort of halfway cutting things out. And you really changed your life, Sarah, it seems. So tell us a little bit about that. How did you get to the point where you thought, that's it, I don't need the more, more, more society we live in anymore. I'm taking drastic decisions in my life to be true to myself and what I believe in, which is all the things you wrote mm -hmm. about in this book. Well, a lot of people think that it must have taken some 
ridiculous amount of willpower and and sacrifice. But to be honest, and I often say this to people, I'm like, no, it kind of is like I worked out how to make my life simpler. It's kind of laziness in some ways or a desire to to not be caught up in a whole heap of stuff. Like, you know, I'd watch my friends spend their weekends driving around shopping malls trying to find a car spot, you know. I just don't go to the shops and, you know, and that frees me up to go and do these other wonderful things like hike and have adventures and and explore different ways of loving the world through poetry and blah, 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 blah. So in some ways um, it was... Yeah, it was kind of just really radical common sense and being so thoroughly fed up with the system. It got me so sick. It it took me to a point, I I was editor of Cosmo and developed this autoimmune disease where I was close to dying and um, I just realised I was so caught up in a system that made no sense. This idea of just buying stuff like that hedonistic treadmill, we know it doesn't produce happiness. We also know that we can't keep consuming infinite stuff on a finite planet like so at what point do we make a decision and live life differently and as I started to sort of live that way and I've lived that way to an extent all my life but I just dialed it up and as I did it it felt it felt radical it felt fun I talk about being a deviant you know and it's kind of you know, even just like not owning a car and riding a bike everywhere, you feel like you have this kind of secret insight into how to cheat life. You know what I mean? Cheat all the dumb stuff that we're meant to be doing. Um, So yeah, my big mantra is that if we want to make change and if we want to encourage other people to make change, we do have to present the new way of doing things as sexier than the status quo, right? It's got to look more charming. And that that's kind of what I try to do. My Instagram feed, everything I do is about just showing that this way of living is actually more fun. It's um, yeah, it produces better results and yeah, rather than trying to make it sound like huge amounts of sacrifice, you know, needs to be made. Um, Sarah, you quote, um, uh, Jean of Arc quote in your book, I'm not afraid I was born to do this. Do you feel that visually? Is that how you show up and how you get over the fear that you do things very differently? There must be some kind of, I mean, at least at the beginning, there must have been yeah. feelings where you thought, wow, yes, you know, you are this deviant that Monbiot describes there must be some fear involved with doing things so differently and so inspirationally. I mean, thank God you do. Thank you so much. That question's an awesome question, actually. Um, People don't always dig down to that level of meatiness in something. Yeah, to that extent, some sacrifice has been made. Um, I also quote Virginia Woolf in the book, and she talks about how some people, particularly women, they live on the shadow side of the sword. You know, this is poetic metaphor that she references. But she basically says that if you do choose to live on the shadow side, it's both perilous and interesting. And she says, I choose interesting. And and I guess I do as well. Um, That probably explains it. But yeah, I, you know, I'm 49. I'm turning 50 shortly. I, I, I live my life in such a way where I do have to accept that there's a lot of loneliness. You know, I often think of myself, I live in Paris now, which is a great place for women like me, always has been throughout history. Um, but I often go and sit at a bar on my own, right? I've got a glass of red wine, I'm doing some work, you know, and people go, oh, how romantic, how wonderful. And yeah, it is. And But I often say, here I am again, the weird old lady sitting at the bar. You know what I mean? Like that's kind of what I've become. But I think the world has changed so much. We are being asked totally different questions to what we were asked in the past. And um, it it almost, I feel it feels appropriate to be, deciding to live your life outside of the status quo and shaking things up a little bit to the if if it's leading to better outcomes and yeah i'm aware of i'm aware of what you're suggesting here that a lot of people might like to live the way that i live but would find it very hard to make that leap because of the implications what does it mean i am single i've been single for 15 years it's very hard to have a relationship um when you're not in one spot when you know you, you you do do things differently, um, and 
yeah, it, it, it has, I guess I've accepted that that's just who I am. It's taken a long, long time. So it's only, and it's very, only very recently that I've accepted that that's who I am, that I, I might be a little bit unusual and that that can be a wonderful thing at this time in history. So thank you for asking, because it's a very new, a new, a new question that I've been asking myself as well. I've had to accept it, right? Like this is where I've ended up, you know? Um, and so I've had to sort of, yeah, ask that very, very same question. Sarah, I would love to comment on that and say you're not old. And to me, it feels like you're just getting going, right? It's not that you arrived at that point. You, you're, everything you've done has been building up to just this moment, I think, where you have already done so much important work. But if I read this book, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so excited what she's going to talk about next, because it feels to me as if you just are getting going, because you really found that for which you you were born to be in this world for. So I'm wondering, Sarah, what are you most proud of to date? Ah, that's a harsh one. That's a hard one to answer, I suppose. I I think I would say I would be most proud. There are often things that I'm not aware of until much later, after many, many years of it being a thing. I go, ah, oh, okay, that I did that. That's what I've done. You know, it's not something that I'm aware of in the moment. But I guess I would be proud of the fact that I have stuck to things. I've really... Um, I've stayed with very difficult problems, whether it was the sugar thing, whether it was anxiety, whether it was the climate crisis, and and my next project is even harder. And I I guess I don't I don't give up on things. I think I'm also proud of the fact that I've carved out a life for myself that didn't exist. It didn't exist in the guidebooks to life. You know, it doesn't exist on the sitcoms. It doesn't exist in a movie where I can go, ah, oh, that's what I'm meant to be doing. Um, and I've and I've survived you know like I didn't give up I didn't I didn't um dissolve I I've managed to I've managed to keep going yeah yeah I think I, I would say you don't only keep going you get stronger with sort of every word you seem to be writing or putting out there and all the causes that you you um are behind Sarah, mm. so this beautiful book uh, that I'm eating up right now, um, there seem to be a lot of tips in there. So I would love for you to give us your top tips on how each one of us can make this world a bit of a better place, because you talk a lot about how each one of us can reduce our carbon footprint. What an unbelievable power each one of us as a consumer has on on the total CO2 emissions. So we have so much power. Each individual on this earth has so much power to change things, which I think young people in this day and age don't believe, right? They think, oh, if China and India don't do that, then anyways, whatever we do, you know, it doesn't matter, which is not true. And that's so beautiful. And you write about this here extensively. So give us your top tips to make this mm. world a more beautiful place. Yeah, I think you pick up on the fact that so much of it is also about optics because young people um, in particular need to see the adults in the room doing something, right? A lot of parents say to me, oh, I'm so, I've got so much hope because children today, they understand biodiversity and they care about recycling. I'm like, no, 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 no. Kids should be just getting on with being kids, right? We shouldn't have hope in the next generation. In fact, we don't even have time, Right to wait for them to become a voting age or to have their own money. Um, we've got to solve this in the next couple of years. So we've got to be adults and we've got to do it fast. And we've got to do it with absolute conviction and like, you know, like kind of kamikaze warriors. So if people want to know what they can do, that actually will shift the dial. The first one is um, eliminating food waste wherever you can. So people think that's very unsexy and how can that make an impact? If food waste were a planet, oh, sorry, a nation, it would be the third biggest CO2 emitter after the US and China. And the bulk of food waste comes from the consumer. It's not from restaurants. It's not from supermarkets, not from the farmers. It's us just literally not shopping properly and peeling stuff we don't need to peel and not eating leftovers, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to make an impact? Do that. Um, and, it, and, it, and it will shift the dial. If we halved our, if, if Western people halved our food waste, it would be the equivalent of 
all of us switching to renewable energy. I mean, that's big. Now, the next thing um, I would say is get rid of your car um, if you can, If uh, maybe get rid of your second car. But the more that you can walk or ride, the more you shift um, public policy in that direction, you reduce air pollution, the, the, the kind of the domino effect is absolutely massive. Plus, you're also getting fit, you know, you're actually contributing to longevity um, overall. Um, so I would say that. And then the third thing, which I write about, and it's kind of a really nice one, is to hike to walk in nature. And that's why I use it as a bit of a trope for writing the book. You know, I needed to find a way to make this book sexier, you know, and to make it enticing to people. And um, walking in nature sort of basically is this incredible way to reconnect in with what matters to us. So, you know, we will save what we love. You know, you see these stories of a 50 kilo woman being able to pick the car off the ch their child. You know, how did they find that strength? We are capable of incredible things if we love something hard enough. And so my little, you know, sort of trick with this book is to uh, write about these incredible hikes that I do and I weave in all the science of how walking in nature affects us in these incredible ways. 42,000 studies have been done on how it does its work to make us feel creative, kinder, um, it alleviates anxiety, depression, blah, blah, blah. So when we do that, we are connecting with nature. We remind ourselves of how much we love this one wild and precious life. And we will probably be capable of doing whatever it takes to save it when we're called up. Um, so, yeah, that would be my third tip. Amazing, Sarah. Thank you. And I love that. That's exactly what this book says and so much more. So, Sarah, what is in store for you? What does the future hold for you? What are your next um, projects? What are you working on? Give us a little um, insight into what's happening for you. Well, I am working on so two books, but the main book that I am exploring at the moment, I've been exploring on my um, Substack newsletter, but also in my conversations on my podcast, Wild. And I, it takes me so long. You've probably gathered, right? Three years for one book, seven years for another book. I have to explore complex stuff for a very long time. So I've been exploring it for a while, but basically it's looking at um, sort of where we're at with not just the climate crisis, but AI, nuclear threat, pandemic threat, all the bifurcation, our inability to solve problems problems, complex problems, the geopolitical stuff that's going down right now. It's kind of the everythingness. And I am exploring ways that we can settle with that in the face of how this everythingness, everythingness is affecting our existential risk. Um, the picture is bad. It's really bad. And I think everybody knows that. Um, and so I'm trying to find philosophies, mindsets that can prepare us best for for what's coming down the pipeline in, in coming years, which is a bad note to finish on. But um, rest assured, my aim is to find the joyous, the joyous, beautiful meta meaning behind all of it. Sarah, you have been described as a pioneer who's very good to look at over the horizon. So what do you predict our world to be like in 10 years time? Gosh, if I've got to answer honestly, I think it's going to be extremely um, shaken up. It's not going to look like it looks today. Um, you know, anyone living on the planet today and he has to look at the weather patternings, what's been happening each summer, um, I think that is the new normal. Um, it's certainly not going to get better. We might have some waves as weather patternings like El Nino and La Nina play a part, but certainly for the next couple of years, it's going to be very, very bad. Um, I think we're going to see a complete shakeup in the world economy and how that operates. Um, and we are going to be forced into a simplification of our lives, which I think to some people might come as a bit of a relief. You know, this, this treadmill, this constant churn and burn, we know it can't hold. I think it's also going to bring about probably a uprising in philosophical thought to be able to hold all of this, um, as it does in tricky times. Between the world wars, you know, existentialism was created. Feminism rose to the fore. Women got the vote. Incredible stuff happens in these tumultuous times. So I think it's going to be a period of rapid change and growth 
um, in certain areas and decline in others. And what I would recommend to anyone listening is to start to, to accept that, to accept that holding the status quo is not going to be possible and the more resilient you can get to change and to softening into real fundamental human principles of love, kindness, generosity, um, you'll be best equipped. Thank you so much, Sarah, for talking to us today, for being of such high service for everything you put out in this world that we are so grateful for. It's really highly inspiring. Please follow the She Can channel and listen to our interview and buy Sarah's books. Thank you so much.